Welcome to Behind the Tools. Here's Tradeify CEO and your host, Michael Steckler. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Behind the Tools. Um, great guests this week. So we have Andy and Angela um, Smith from Lifestyle Tradey uh, over there in the northern beaches of Sydney. Welcome to the show. Hey mate, how you Thank doing? you. It's good to yeah, be here. Yeah, good. Great to have you on board. I'm really, I'm really excited firstly by the sort of journey um, that you're now, you know, Lifestyle Tradey, I think you're trying to help businesses sort of set the path to growth, possible exit, whatever that looks like for them. Um, I think it's worth starting maybe, Andy, with your journey, sort of how you got here and, you know, the business you had previously and how that led you to this to this path. Yeah, pretty much started, decided I wanted to be a plumber, the best trade in the world, just for anyone else out there listening, and uh, <laughs> um, started Andrew Smith Plumbing. It was pretty original and started working pretty hard, and then the next minute, this gorgeous lady came walking in front of me, and uh, yes, Angela, standing next to me right now, and we decided to travel around Australia for 13 months, and then we headed yeah. over to... Um, we headed over to the snow. Actually, I was like, I'm starting my business. I just want to get the business absolutely pumping. And Angie's like, I'm going to Canada. I'm like, well, I'm starting the business again. I'm going to Canada. And then I just had to chase her to Canada because I thought I'd never get another shot. Um, we spent 13 months over there in Canada and we came back and we realized Andrew Smith Plumbing wasn't necessarily the business name we wanted. So we went down the name of Dr. Drip. Um, when someone yep. first mentioned that name to me, I was like, there is no way in this world I'm going to call myself Dr. Drip. <laughs> but um, yeah, we did it. And it was a good marketing ploy. So did you did you do any, what were you doing in Canada? Were you working when you were there or? We lived in a snow, we lived on the snow fields in Big White in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I ran ski school. So that was really cool, except for the fact it came with me working full time and Andy became a snowboard instructor and he hardly worked at all. He went out for freshies every morning and that was pretty much it. It was a Andy, perfect that, was that, I wish we could was go that, back to that. Was it, was it intentional or there just no one learning to snowboard? <laughs> No, we we went over there and and um, I was looking for a job. I wasn't really sure what. And and then someone saw me and said, "Hey, you should be a snowboard instructor." I did a few courses. It was pretty easy to be honest. And um, started off in kids club and helping out with the kids. And then then I realised I think I was getting paid seven dollars eighty an hour back then. Um, it's around about twenty seven years ago or so. But um, it wasn't a lot of money even then. And I could get private lessons. I could get $25 an yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I started doing private lessons and, and yeah, that was the way it went for us. And we, we nailed it. It was great. So you, then you come back and you, you create Dr. Drip. Um, whose idea was that, by the way? Where'd you get that name from? It was actually a, a mate's girlfriend. And she laughed and she said, you should call yourself Dr. Drip. And as I mentioned, I was like, there's no way I'd call myself that name. And I came and mentioned it to Ange and she laughed. And then I mentioned it to my parents and she laughed. I mentioned it to friends and everyone laughed. And and after about a month or so, Ange came back and goes, you know what? It's a catchy name. You know, maybe yeah, a, yeah. as a marketing point of view, why don't we go down that? So we decided to go with Dr. Drip. Yeah, no, it makes a ton of sense. And so the business, you know, you grew the business. You want to talk through that journey? Yeah. So we we started off as a one-man show, as we did. We get the van, we grab some tools, and we're off down the road. And um, we were lucky that uh, we grew quite rapidly. And um, yeah. we had a lot of success in the early years. We, we grew to a team of 17. We had eight trucks on the road. And we did a lot of um, residential and a hell of a lot of strata um, work, strata right. management work at the time. And, and um, things were going great. You know, we, we um, sort of, we we're, we were making up to 50 K profit a month, which is huge bucks back then. But then as we grew and things got out of control and we didn't really have a job software management software yeah. that we we're using, it was back in the old paper days and using these paper job cards and, all of a sudden we went from making huge amount of money to being totally out of control and boys were losing paperwork and it was just so messy back then. So yeah, we've, we've, we've gone from being at an all time high to being at an all time low to then changing everything and, and um, re-systemizing and structuring the business right. and getting the right job management system and getting all our procedures in place to then in 13 short months, turning that business around and, and um, yeah, getting the success that every tradie dreams of and being able to sort of step off the tools. I was working only a couple of hours a week, which was huge. Yeah, it's amazing. And was there a moment when you realized that you were unprofitable or that you'd reached that point or was, did it happen slowly or was it just a day where you woke up and sort of looked at the books and went, oh, we got, we got a problem here? No, it, 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 it was happening over a period. And yeah. um, 
And I think like most tradies, we can sort of sense it or we can see it depending on how well you know your numbers. But it was, we we'll try. I was trying to fix it, but I was also sticking my head in the sand as well. And I'm like, it's going to get better next month. It's going to get better. And, and then um, it really got to a point where the accountant's gone, what is going on in your business? You were flying right. and now yeah, you're sinking. Yeah. And why? And um, there, there wasn't one reason, but I think just staff and structures and we just we just grew way too fast, too quickly. And all of a sudden, everything started spiraling out of control. And so how did you... Um... Talk us through how you fixed it. What was the what was the thing that changed? And 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 Andrew, I think that's when you you got involved or more involved in the business. But do you maybe want to sort of, you know, how did you how did you approach that? I had been involved um, a little bit prior, so I came into the business from a corporate world and moved over um, in the, somewhat in the early days. I think we had probably about a team of seven or whatever <clears throat> at that point. So I was there through that time when the business did was doing really well in the glory yeah. days. Um, and then we had our first child. We had Hannah, who is now 16. So this is a long time ago. Um, and so I wasn't actually around a lot, but I was very conscious that I didn't see Andy at all. So he would right. leave really early in the morning. He would come home very late at night. Um, and we would had Hannah through IVF. So it was very clear that we wanted to have a child and wanted to be around her. Um, but Andy was missing her life completely. Um, right. And I pretty much just said to him, no more. We can't do this anymore. Wait there. This is what you said. So <laughs> she pulled me in one day and, and pretty much said, oh, I've had a gut full of this and it's, I just can't continue this down this path. And um, it wasn't like it's over. The, the world's come crashing to an end, but it wasn't far off it. And, um, and in true Andy spirit, being a bit of a hothead and, and also being a bit of a control freak, um, my first course of action was pretty much to rip in and say, how dare you? You know, it was Dr. Drip was my baby. I was working 80 hours a week. I was doing, I was doing it for the family and I responded yeah, yeah. In, a, in a pretty tough way and stormed out of the house. But um, it didn't take me long to realize that business just wasn't going well enough. I was pulling money out of our home loan to help support the business, which she didn't know about. I, I was doing all these things behind the scene. And, and you know what, when you have that much pressure, sometimes there's that, that's something that snaps and, right. and I knew it was coming, but that's the point where I pretty much turned back up to Ange in tears. And I, I'm not ashamed to say that. And it was just like, we're, I'm just in a world of pain at the moment. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. You know, everyone looks at me as being this absolute superstar because we'd grown this big business and, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm stuffed. Yeah. Yeah. And it that's wasn't not an a good uncommon place. No, that's not an uncommon, I mean, unfortunately in trades business, it's not an uncommon situation to be in, right? Which is um, often people don't necessarily reach the pinnacle of the, that type of profit, but they're certainly in that position where on the outside, they're really busy, loads of customers working all the hours at the end of the month, they're like, actually, I can't, you know, can't necessarily pay the bills. Um, so I think that seems to be a very, very common story. And there seems to always be these inflection points where there's a either a tough conversation at home or at work that prompts them to sort of reflect and, and look. So what, what did you do? I mean, what, are the, what was the things that you enacted to, to turn that around over that 13 month period? Well, this began a very um, detailed conversation between Annie and I to say, we can't fix something unless I truthfully know what's going on. So right. um, we literally had to strip the business apart. We sat with our accountant and went through our P&L and our balance sheets and really got a good grasp of what was happening. As Andy said, we had a team of 17. So we really stripped back and uh, about the process of a job, like the flow of a yeah. job and what was happening and where the hurdles were. Um, and we knew that we weren't armed to fix this ourselves. Or that's the way we thought. Um, as a trade, you know, Andy being a plumber, for instance, my background was hospitality and marketing. Um, and we just, you know, for Andy specifically, we were like, well, you went to TAFE, you've been taught how to be a plumber and work with your hands, but no one's taught you business principles. Right. No one's taught you money or marketing or how to deal with people. And so we actually tried to find a coach who would assist yeah. us to try and fix this. Um, and we did actually take on a coach and spent a huge amount of money with this person. Um, and to be honest, we ended up coaching him because he'd never operated his own business. He'd never understood even trade. And we realized that that was not a good idea. So we got out of that contract. Um, and then because I had a child, I was at home and Andy started 
leaning yeah, on the we, professionals of all these different aspects of yeah. marketing wall. We were lucky that we had made money over the years. So it wasn't like we were poor, but we obviously were losing money. It was a very big yeah. leaking bucket. It was pouring. Um, and we realized that we needed to find someone else and there's no one in the trades arena that was doing it well and, and really understood that. So we just found the best of the best people in Australia in marketing and systemizations and, and we just worked with that. We looked overseas a bit as well. And if you look at it now, we've spent probably well over 300000 on our education to get to wow. where we are yeah. now. Yeah. Like we, we weren't afraid to spend some money. We didn't spend that all at once. That's, that's over a 15-year period. But we realized sometimes you do need to spend money to help you put things in place to make more money. And for me, I'm all about speed and I'm happy to pay for it, right? So right. I'm happy right. to pay for speed. And I think everyone out there in business you should be like that because if you can, you know, if that can help you go to that next mile, that money will be nothing compared to what you can earn later down the track. Where you get to yeah. next. Yeah, it's short mm-hmm. sex in that growth. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So you got kind of educated and it sounds like you were sort of smart enough to acknowledge the things that you didn't have the skill set in and go and find the people that did and, and help you enable that. And then over that period, you obviously turned the business around. And then, you know, what, what happened then? What led to Lifestyle Trading? Yeah, so I had a good mate, one of our mentors actually that's helped us through the tough times and and he um, reached out to me this day and he said, hey, Andy, what are you doing on Friday? And I think it was like a Monday or a Tuesday. And I said, oh, I don't know why. And he said, I want you to come to the Gold Coast. And I'm like, okay. He said, you've got to bring Ange. I went, okay. Um, he said, and we're going to have a meeting for about six or seven hours. So fly in early, we'll fly out late. And I said, okay, well, what's all that about? And he goes, I'll go through it all with you when you sit down with me. The other thing is I want you to put $6,000 in my bank account as well. And I'm like, well, what is that for? And he said, because I'm going to give you a million dollar idea that you haven't thought about and it's going to change your world. And I went, okay. So, um, you know, that was a lot of money back then, but we did it and we flew up there and pretty much he sat down and said to us, you've been in business for a long time. Um, you've grown your business to great heights. You sunk to great lows. Um, you understand you've yeah. turned that business around in 13 months. You've got all the structures, all the platforms, you know exactly how to do it. He said it, nearly every single plumber or trade business out there needs this as well. Um, it's your job to go out and teach people this. And I was like, oh, wow, really? And he's like, yes. And he said, you know, what you and Ange have been through, the tough times, he said, you know, there's there's a millions of people out there going through those so same tough times at the moment because their business is running as poor as what yours used to run. And it's your job to help teach people how to do that. And um, it was, a, we sort of walked away from that going, Oh, wow. You know, um, this is uh, a bit of a crazy thought, but um, we were sort of at a point where I was only working at not that lot much in the business um, yeah. anymore. Yeah. And it was like the next adventure for us. And I was very excited about it. And yeah, we started to step up to the plate and lifestyle life- trading was born 2009. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. And so is- 2009, there was less, less of those around, would it be fair to say? Less, less. Was, I mean, there, well, there was none around. We were the first, yeah. uh, we were yeah. the first and, um, and still the best, but uh, that's my, my perception. <laughs> but, I um, can't comment yeah, on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so we've been doing it for a very long time. And, and the thing with us is, what we're looking for is a community. So, you know, what we want is most of our members stay with us for a minimum of four to five years. Um, We've got members that are still using us 12 years later. We only started 13 years ago. So um, people don't hang around with you if you don't give value. Um, And we're not looking for someone to come in, do a quick short burst, get their money and then kick them out the door. We want people the long term. And it's all about our tribe and our community. And we have 200 of some of the best trade businesses in Australia. Some are turning over $10 million and have 50 staff and some are startups starting at, you know, 250, 300,000 to start. Yeah. Yeah. But what is um, really amazing is the fact that from the very beginning of Lifestyle Tradie, our education has always come from a truthful place of we have done this inside our trade business and we're literally just going to show you exactly what to do this is about fast tracking I truthfully want you to copy what I'm doing and now just tweak it because of you know you want to make it more personalized or tailored to your business for instance Um, and that's very rare in the trade industry you would know this too where most tradies are very guarded with their knowledge and with their success and failure stories they just don't talk about it and there's nothing that we teach that we haven't run in our business for the last 21 years or you know the 
the the back end of it um, of the last um, 20, 20 years or whatever. And and we that's what we teach. It's it's learnings that we've been there, we've done that, and all of our members have been doing that for the last ten years too. So it's proven. Um, it's just right. a matter of putting a little bit of time and effort into it, and you'll get those results. And you think that it's more authentic and powerful because you had that bad period that you had to recover from that's given you the you know because actually sometimes you learn more from those um failure is probably too strong a term but the sort of the downward spirals and the things that don't work out yeah i think um you know if it doesn't kill you it you know you learn from it and you're better from it and there's no doubt about that and it's it's really interesting you look at some of the most successful people um you know around the world if it's small success or big success we've all have our ups and downs we're all the same we all make mistakes but i think when you learn from those mistakes and come out them the other side, you're always going to be better. Yeah, hundred percent. And what do you? So now the companies you work with, um, you know, you, you said you're you're working across um, different scale from the the bigger companies to the smaller ones. Yep. What sort of the most common mistakes that you still see? What are the things that you sort of? If I said to you, "Hey, I'm going to bring a trade business in tomorrow," you never met them, and you were going to try and guess what the issue was. What what would be the most common thing that comes up? Well, probably the first one is the job management system. And obviously, Tradeify is one of the best job management systems out there. But a lot of people come to you and they say, I'm using this system and it's rubbish or it's no good or I don't really yeah. like it. And the the moral of the story is this. They haven't put the time and effort into actually learning what it can actually do to get the benefit out of it. Um, there, was, there was just a phase going around the trade industry that if you didn't have an iPad and a job management system, you're a nuffy and you need to do something about it, right? So everyone just right. got a job management system and an iPad, but they didn't know how to use it. And half the people were using like less than 30%. And I'm like, hello. So that would be the first thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah, we, we obviously we, I'm kind of speaking from a position of bias, but um, yeah. yeah, we see that, right? I think it's, I think the thing that people underestimate in trades companies is that it does require effort. And it means that you end up, but de facto going back to what you used to do, which is like, actually, God, this is painful. It's easy for me to go back to pen and paper or text messaging or sending it, you know, using a spreadsheet, whatever that looks like. So I think we have, um, yeah, and it's not us. I think other job management software companies have done the same, which is invested yep. probably more in that onboarding and training and human support to enable that because it is a difficult thing to, to transition. And do you have any sort of great stories from companies you've worked with that you've seen that maybe are in the similar position to where you were at or all the ones that have started out afresh over that sort of four or five year journey that you're particularly proud of? Well, yeah, well, one of our members, he started with us about four and a half years ago. Um, he was from Adelaide. He was turning over around about 170, 180,000 when he started. And, and I can still remember his words. He said, Andy, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I just want to have Dr. Drip in Adelaide. So I'm just going right. to do exactly what you do. And that's all I'm going to do. Now, this guy was really gun ho um, Four and a half years later, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a range between five and eight mil, um, around yeah. 30 guys, absolutely smoking. Um, and that all comes down to the fact that he got his business model right. And anyone out there listening, it's the same. Most yeah. people have built a business on shaky foundations. And whenever there's a little bit of a shake, they're in trouble. Um, you've got to get your foundations right. So you've, you've set it up the right way the first time, and then you can start to scale. Um, as, as you may know, or the listeners may know, but we started a book called Start Up, Scale yeah. Up, Sell Up. And we teach people how to start their business the right way first. Once you do that first, you've got the foundations, then you can scale. And then once you're scaled, you can get up into that sell up um, stage. Um, not everyone wants to sell, I understand that, but you can step away from the business and it can run without you. Yeah, and is that aspirational piece important? Is that a discussion you generally have with people? Because some people's aspiration is there's three of us. I like it that way. I just want to yep. have a decent, steady business. And there's the others who come in and say, as your example, yep. which is, hey, I very much want to have this many yep. trucks and this many vans on the road and this many people and, and grow this yeah. thing. So hence the name, Lifestyle Tradie, not yep. Billionaire Tradie. It's Lifestyle Tradie. And the main thing that we like to set up is making sure that they get their life back. And that's the most important stuff to us. We want to make a little bit of money as well. I also want to add to that. Our tagline is freedom to choose. Mm. So, the, so the whole point of this, when we talk about your ultimate goal as a trade business owner is to hit freedom. Well, what does freedom mean to you? And freedom is often about 
I want to make more money, which money is not turnover. Turnover is vanity. It's all got to be about profit margins. Um, it's about time, which is what they all say is I want to be able to take time off whenever I want. Yep. Uh, and yep. then they say, I want control. I want guys to do stuff my way. But what's cool about freedom is freedom means something completely different to every single trade business owner we speak with. We just want to ensure that every business owner gets to a position whereby they truthfully can take time away and not come back to a basket case. It needs to be streamlined so that even if it's one other person inside the business as they start to scale, that they know the business is profitable whilst they're absent. And then they can yeah. choose. I choose to stay working on the tools with my boys because I love it. I choose to become a manager and just manage from above. I choose to Im implement a general manager as an example and just passively earn money from this business or I choose to sell. And that's what's so amazing with trade business is if you understand the principles, like Andy said, getting this business model right, if you do that perfectly, you do get the life that you actually wanted when you yeah. first started your business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. real. Which is the aspiration that everyone has, whether, and like you say, whether that's actually, I just want to keep on the tools because I love working on the tools, whether it's, I want to, I want the ability to be able to step back, even if they then decide not to step back. Um, I mean, everyone's talking about four day weeks and, and all this kind of stuff. And that again, for some people, that's the ambition. It's not about being off the tools. It's about being off the tools for one extra day and the ability to be able to do that. So uh, I think that's really important. And, and do you think, um, this, sorry, go on, no, go on, Andy. No, I was just going to say, and I think there is a perception out there with a lot of trade business owners that you can't do that. Mm. It's too hard. Right. I can't do that. The old bloke down the road, he couldn't do it. You know, when you start to when you start to grow, or if you go any bigger than four or five trucks, the wheels start falling off and you come crashing back again. Um, I can't get past the one million barrier. Like there's all these stories that everyone yeah. tells themselves to make themselves feel better. You can do whatever you want to do, but you've just got to have the tools and the know how to do it. And then you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think, um, you know, as one of the first, um, you know, in this in this area dedicated to, to trade companies, do you think the business coaching, I mean, I speak to lots of trades companies, most are generally positive. They don't always have the, they not all have a great experience to, to your example. Do you think it's improved? Do you think there's more companies now that are dedicated to trades businesses? Do you think the gender of the game has been sort of lifted? Or do you think there's still, I, still a lot of work to do? Well, Listen, there's different people out there and um, there's different business owners when it comes to trade business coaches. Some are in it just for the money. Some are in it yeah. for what they're giving back to the community. Um, I'd like to think where well, we definitely are the ones that are giving back to the community. Um, you know, no one can join Lifestyle Tradie unless they come through me. So you've got to be the right fit and that's where it is. Now that keeps our numbers a little bit down. But we know our people stay for the long term. A lot right. of people that come in, they spend the money, they get sold the dream, they put big dollars down, and then they don't feel like they get anything from it, and they get kicked out the back door, and they just lost their money. And then all of a sudden, they think, oh, my God, I'm never doing that ever again. And that's the challenge I've seen. Um Around about 40% of all of our members have had another coach before. So that is something that you said right there. Yeah, I'll right. just add to that. What is important is ensuring um, that for any trade business owner, if they are going to reach out to get a coach, then try it. Well, definitely ensure that someone has experience in trade. Uh, speaking from experience, that didn't work for us. We needed someone to actually understand our industry. But to actually answer your question, this industry from a coaching perspective about education, about arming other trade business owners, how to be better in business is definitely a growing industry. Like when I think mm -hmm. 13 years ago, when we first started Lifestyle Trading, yeah. Yeah. we were the only coach, you know, education company around. We definitely, there are definitely more. And I think that is fabulous for the industry because it's, it's highlighting to trade business owners that you can get help. But as I said, just make sure that you're leaning on someone. If that is what you're going to do is part with money for ROI, then get someone who actually understands your industry. But I love that the industry has changed because it's not about you understanding buy a new tool like a jetter or a new digger or something to make money. The real way to make money in trade is to learn the skills of business, get business acumen, get your foundations right. Um, and then you're going to be able to understand, oh, these pieces of equipment can like help me make money just yeah, on that particular yeah. job. But the true art of of making money is being a businessman first. Business yeah. person. Business person. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. That's yeah. so true. Yeah, Good I on know. you, Andy. I know. I'm, I'm back. <laughs>
<laughs> Fantastic. And then, and the sort of last couple of questions around it was, I mean, did that prompt the, the books were, I mean, I guess they're sort of a marketing exercise on one hand, but also a sort of a way to give back and allow people to have the sort of template, I guess, to, to do some of that stuff. Yes. Start up, scale up, sell up specifically is really important to show trade business owners how life changes in each growth phase. So what life might look like for them, what challenges they may face, and then hence what they should be focused on. Because as you grow things, um, I wouldn't say things necessarily get, they don't, they don't necessarily get easier. I suppose your knowledge foundation gets better. So therefore you become more confident, but you're just faced with different challenges. You now, instead yeah. of having one, you know, no staff, you all of a sudden you have 10 staff or whatever, but again, that's your choice. You might decide to only have three or you might decide to have 50. So the growth, the, the, the changes in that growth phase is really important for a trade business owner to understand, oh, kind of this is the journey. Um, and I've just released a new book called um, Tradey Wife, Why Winging It Isn't Working and How um, Creating Old Habits um, Will Help. And this is really important because from a female's perspective, from experience, I know that a lot of trade businesses have the female join the business and it's often organic. You know, she's yeah. decided to have a baby and now she's put her hand up to say, Hey, I'm st sitting around doing nothing. How can I help you? Um, and he, and I say this respectfully for all you trade business owners out there, you put so much emphasis on the importance of a tradesman being out or tradesperson being out on the field, earning you money, billable time, but that second, that other side of business, there are two sides to business, the front facing out on the tools, earning money and the, and the, in the coal face, you know, behind the scenes, this admin side of business and one cannot function without the other. And no, often no. when she becomes really entrenched in that business and starts to take ownership of this role, um, she feels like she's a little belittled, I suppose, even when she gets to a position whereby she may even work full time. So what I love about the conversations that we're having now through trade is really ensure that you place importance on the admin side of any operation because the flow of a job transcends across both. So that's what's been really cool is to highlight that through these books. Yeah, because it's the difference between profitability and, and a business that goes under. I mean, it ultimately is, I think, in, in the experience we've seen is, you know, getting demand and being busy is it sort of seems to be a given, right? And hope I hope it continues that way. But that's the way it's been for a while where, you know, certainly for the last few years, uh, most trades companies are super busy, they're on the tools, they're doing lots of work. Um, and I saw a horrific stat about the number of those businesses that are actually unprofitable. And that's part of the reason is they're just not, they're not collecting cash, cash flow is terrible, they're paying supplies, but then the customers aren't paying them all these sorts of things, which is hard to keep on top of if you don't have a a system and a system could be person and software but it could just be a person even to to manage that stuff so uh, and whether that's a full-time employee or someone that you outsource to um that seems to make the biggest difference and is that and so and aside I, from sorry go on andy i was just going to say because a lot of people like i we come that come to us um not always but some of them just aren't making money they're not making any profit yeah. and um there's a lot of businesses that i talk to just all around australia and in new zealand um, and they're running really at less than 5% net profit margin and paying themselves a very basic wage. You know, um, a lot of the people that we're actually directly working with now are doing like 15 to 30%. So yeah. there's a real big difference of knowing how to go about it the right way and making a dramatic impact on your net profit at the end of the year. Um, as we know, turnover is one thing, but it's really that net profit that's really sexy at the end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. We always finish on a, this is, this is really helpful. Um, last, last sort of question around the business is, you know, if someone is looking for a coach and they don't call you, they, they, they might be in a different area or a different part of the world, who would, um, is there a sort of series of questions or a question you would recommend they ask a potential coach to suss out if they're yep. the, the real deal? I think the first one would be, and Ange mentioned it, have they had a trade business before? Yeah. How long had they been in that trade business? And was that trade business actually successful? Um, for your listeners, and not everyone would know this, we'd been, Dr. Drip been going for 21 years. We just sold Dr. Drip in November last year for really good dollars. Thank you very much. But um, we've yeah. been there. We've done that. We've been through the journey. And I think if coaches haven't been through that journey, they don't understand the whole cycle of how to run a business. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Great. 
Um, fantastic. Last few questions we always ask everyone. Um, Andy, I, Andy, I think I know your answer because you did a big sort of song and dance about being a plumber at the start. So I'm <laughs> guessing. <laughs> but if you, if you weren't a plumber um, yeah. by trade, what trade would you have picked? Oh, definitely not, not an electrician. They're absolute rubbish. Um, no, uh, no. We, are, uh, we, quite like, a, we quite like electricians. So. Yeah, no. <laughs> and we I like plumbers and, as well. And, we like them all. And, yeah, no, I do as well. But we just like to have that bit of banter between plumbers yeah, and electricians. Too, yes, but so. honestly. Who's better, they I, say. Yeah, if Who's I couldn't better? be a plumber, I definitely would be an electrician. I hate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and Ange, if you were in the trade, would you have, what would you have picked? Gee, I don't even know. I, I couldn't even answer. I quite like the idea of um, of building or doing like landscaping or something where you're outside, yeah. but you can actually see the results. I think that's a challenge we've always had in plumbing was they do this, some of this incredible work and then it yeah. just gets yeah. covered up in grass and we're like, oh my God, that's so like, that's the worst. Like I can't even celebrate because I can't even see it. You need yeah. to be able to yeah. see it. So yeah, landscaper, yeah, builder, yeah. something like that, that I can go, I, I'd be that mother that would drive past and go, hey, kids, I built that house. Yeah. And yeah. I did that lawn. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Cool. And then is it, did you have a tool of choice when you were on the, when you were on the tools as a business? Did you have a brand of choice that you would always use? No, not necessarily. I, I think when I talk a tool of cho choice, being a plumber was our high pressure drain um, yeah. system. I mean, they've, made made us a lot of money over the years with block drains and i still think that if you don't have one of those i know in new zealand um the plumbers not as, they don't have them as much but uh it's a, certainly a, a great way to go and, and globally yeah. it's a, just and it's efficiency right. right yeah it's efficiency yeah. yeah yeah cool and then last question anyone else do you think we should speak to you come across obviously a lot of um both trades companies and people in the industry across uh this part of the world uh anyone that you think would make a make an interesting conversation that's worth us yeah, there's a guy of the name of Daniel Hearn. Um, he's just started a business called Buy for Tradies. And um, he's a like a buying group. The biggest thing I'm noticing um, through all the industry is problem with stock and suppliers, yeah. um, pricing. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of weird and wonderful things happening at the moment. And most trade business owners have had a bit of a gutful. And I think it is time that us trade business owners to stand up a little bit to this. And, and um, we just seem like... We're, we're getting materials are going through the roof and I understand there's reasons why, but they're actually going a lot higher than they need to go. And then it's our job to try and sell that to builders and customers. And we're like the salespeople to try and get jobs across the line. And, and I, I find, I find that a bit tough at the moment. So I, I think someone like that. Has that level of, because pricing, presumably when you're talking about, you talked about net profit, pricing is one of the big drivers of whether it's the hourly rate or the materials themselves and how they mark those up or don't mark them up. Is Has that become a really a bigger issue for you in the last few months that you're talking to lots of trade businesses about because of the dynamic nature of where pricing has been and where it's going? Yeah, and you find that a few of the big boys, because they've got the buying power, they're actually, they've negotiated really good rates. And you've got the smaller business owners that are doing 2 million and under, which is majority of trade businesses out yeah. there and they're getting screwed. Um, and they just can't compete with some of these guys. And that is a hundred percent wrong. So um, I think it's about banding together a little bit more and working as a, as a bit of a, a group, a buying group. And, and I, I think if we can do that, it'll make a dramatic difference for everyone. Cool. Great. Well, look, thank you so much. Really appreciate you spending the time um, and, uh, you know, what you're doing for the industry, trying to push things forward. I think it's definitely uh, been really helpful for anyone that's in the uh, small end of town, maybe starting out, listening to your journey. And, and it's probably really useful for people that are on that journey and maybe having a bit of a bad year and maybe need a reset. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for joining the podcast. Um, and Great. we shall speak to you soon. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having right. us. You're yeah, welcome. thanks for having us, mate. And um, if anyone's interested too on Spotify, if you don't mind me saying this, um, no, you're welcome. the Trady Go Show. Um, the Trady Show, we run a podcast just like this called The Trady Show. And and really, it's just about education. We just teach the whole way through it. It's just Ange and I. Um, and it's a good way to sort of look at business from a different way. And um, everything we talk about is exactly what we teach and what our members are constantly doing and getting massive success. So um, on any, wherever you get your podcast from, The Trady Show, Together in yep. Trade Business, it's good. Cool. And we'll probably include some links to, to track um, you guys down in the books and everything else uh, right. in our show notes. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Thanks very much. See you soon. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we shall speak next time. Cheers. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Behind the Tools is brought to you by Tradeify. 
job management software for your trade business. If you enjoyed the podcast, let us know by leaving a review and be sure to tell your mates about it. Email behindthetools at tradeifyhq.com if you or someone you know would be keen to join the show as a guest.